the mm-hmm. price you're asking. Mm-hmm. And all these things are, are kind of unhelpful. So there's always a dance that will now go on for the rest of this book mm-hmm. where language has to be looked at quite cautiously because it inherently misleads mm-hmm. in this kind of process. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I just started recording. Does anyone object to that? Okay. Okay, I'll uh, carry on. Rinpoche says, we can confront mind directly and challenge the ease with which it slips into negative modes of expression. We can question who is telling me that I have to play these games? Who is responding to this demand? Is this role necessary? I no longer wish to participate in this drama. Questioning mind, questioning mind and refusing to own the responses it is urging us to manifest can almost magically lessen the force of strong emotions. Hmm. The next time you get frustrated, angry, or upset, try to do this. If you awaken in the middle of the night, in the middle of such a programmed emotion and ask, who is asking me to do this? The program behavior will dissipate. Humor often manifests, particularly if anger is confronted if it's confronted in this manner. For example, if you are in the middle of arguing with someone and you suddenly awaken and ask this of yourself, you may burst out laughing. Arguments suddenly feel totally ridiculous and unnecessary. This behavior pattern transforms the moment it is confronted. What you are doing is introducing your natural intelligence into a learned behavior. I think that's, that's an important sentence. What you're doing is introducing your natural intelligence into a learned behavior. When we divest our power from learned behavior by allowing natural intelligence to confront it, it not only becomes powerless, it becomes absurd. This is not mindfulness in the conventionally understood sense. This is the consequence of self-inquiry. It reminds me of something that happened to me a few years ago. Uh, in a, I remember of recording banner because you're you're behind a sign can you get rid of that banner that's the recording host no banner just click on it if you um i think click you're on screen. Screen. yeah click on your, your screen you're you, you i don't know you may have to live with it nuke because you're on an iPhone. click on your screen it'll go away it, it just does that yep. until you click on the screen that goes away yep. it should say like got it and if you click got it it'll go away there i believe yeah just on the screen it'll go away Anyhow, see what you can do, Nukem. We'll carry on with the discussion. Uh, well, anyway, I'll just say this in a short way. It was uh, something that was happening when I was at a galley harbor, and there was all these guys hanging out and drinking and causing, they weren't really causing trouble, but they were just, why were they there? And uh, I came walking off one morning. I just read them the <laughs> riot act mm-hmm. about what they were doing. And then I turned and started to walk away, and I just began laughing because I just, yeah. <laughs> because it was gone it was gone and i i wasn't mad at him anymore i i, I just was I, I don't know i was just chuckling about the whole thing hmm. and it was a nice kind of uh you know i, I said my piece i turned around and i i started to laugh hmm. i didn't let them see that i didn't want it that, then i would have <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah how many that's of, what we're talking about perhaps how many of you guys have done mindfulness meditation some yeah because often the instruction in mindfulness um, is to observe the three marks. Have you been told to do that? Hmm. Observe, you know, see anatta, see selflessness, see anicca, see impermanence, Hmm. see dukkha, see suffering. Have you been told to do that? That's often a quite, that's quite a common instruction. And that's what I'm referring to is that kind of highly dualistic instruction where you're asked to look at your experience. And of course, this is not that. <laughs> yeah. Not, um, and so that's why this is a reference to mindfulness there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't criticize mindfulness much because it's very effective if, if you mm-hmm. stick at it. Mm-hmm. But often it works and people don't know why. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but the reason it's working is because one's exhausting mm-hmm. the word reference mm-hmm. that the regime of mind uses 
to make a map of the world through sustained attention and consequently you break into natural intelligence it's through a process of exhaustion mm. um but this isn't normally explained at all in mindfulness meditation which is why when people get off their cushion they lose it so quickly because mm -hmm. they have no idea what they were doing mm. and so often you find mindfulness meditators who land up saying well i have to meditate eight hours a day or sort of thing <laughs> it's not uncommon at all and it's the moment they get off the cushion, they're back yeah. into the and they don't know why they've got no, mm -hmm. no way of dealing right. with their loss of uh, mindfulness when they are confronted by normal circumstance, mm -hmm. which means the technique works, it doesn't last. And that's because it lacks understanding. Mm -hmm. And so this is what, why this mm -hmm. comes. Yeah. Since you brought up meditation, as a, I, I had a, a question about Oh. Um, <clears throat> the role of shamatha meditation and uh, how at times, you know, it, it, there are times in which it, you seem to encourage it. And then at times I even think I saw where you said, well, that's really not going to get you there. And so I, I just wanted to know uh, what you might have to say about that. Oh, yeah, I'm actually very pro shamatha. I, okay. I um, the, my view basically, is that there is only one type of meditation, which is shamatha. That's to say, if shamatha <coughs> properly developed, it leads to vipassana. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This is a because vipassana just means seeing clearly. So if you truly stabilize the mind, you will see clearly you will vipassana, literally that mm -hmm. the, the enigma is why didn't Buddha's teachers therefore see clearly? And so there's always been this issue in the Dharma that, I don't know if you know this, but Buddha's Shamatha meditation isn't Buddhist. It's actually pre-Buddhist. Mm. He actually learned all the techniques of Shamatha meditation from two, mm. well, I suppose you would call uh, probably Vedic teachers, mm -hmm. Draka and Ramaputra, mm -hmm. who were both basically Kamala, Kamala Draka and, and something Ramaputra, that guy. And they were both Shamatha masters. Mm -hmm. um, and they taught him the jhanas, so the Buddha um, left them to seek enlightenment because he realized those techniques weren't working. And the reason is because they contained within them mm -hmm. a subtle reification of self. Mm -hmm. And it was only when he truly transcended that that he became enlightened. So that final insight was the moment of enlightenment, which is Vipassana. Mm -hmm. Now, Vipassana meditation as taught by the Burmese is largely shamatha. Mm -hmm. Breath watching is shamatha. So we, you, you hear people going on, quote, Vipassana retreats. Mm -hmm. What they actually practice is shamatha. <laughs> and um, that's a bit of a joke. And it's because yeah. shamatha got a kind of bad name mm -hmm. because it was involved with these things called jhanas, which are these states of absorption, mm -hmm. which are hard to achieve, and was associated with magic. Mm -hmm. And consequently, in the modernization of meditation that occurred in the 1930s and 40s, in Burma, mm -hmm. um, they were very keen to kind of clean it up mm -hmm. from the traditional clothing it was in. And so they kind of downplayed shamatha. Mm -hmm. but the the <clears throat> fact is that this sort of approach is sometimes called the union of Vipassana and shamatha, mm -hmm. or is sometimes just called pure shamatha. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so that's why, you know, actually shamatha <clears throat> Think is great. Shamatha mm -hmm. is still like playing the violin or mm -hmm. you know, skiing or something. Mm -hmm. It's not actually religious at all. No, no. But the key is that having established, and this is why Revelation's destruction where it is, because unless you have a shamatha base, it's hard to achieve the distinction between small you understanding and big you understanding, mm -hmm. because you become entangled in small you understanding and if you have no base of calmness you're unaware of it so you get tumbled into right. conceptuality the whole time okay. through lacking a stable mm -hmm. base of shamatha okay so this is the key and mm -hmm. i often feel as i said earlier that some of the instructions given by vipassana meditators are inherently dualistic mm -hmm. so they are they are really in a way reinforcing the dualistic perspective they're criticizing mm. because they say, you know, how was it for you? Or, what was your experience? All these sorts of questions yeah. are essentially dualistic questions. And 
Yeah. To me, at least, that seems a bit of a nonsense. Um, <laughs> so that's my view on Shamata. Okay. But clearly, I, I, I hear what one of the things I hear you saying is that um, to really get from the small you to the big you understanding, um, it's, it, it's going to make you're going to need a Shamata base from which to approach that, right? Well, yeah, but I think it's important just to rephrase that question. Okay. Big you understanding is always present. Mm. Oh. Big you understanding is always present in every moment of cognition. That's essentially what mm. the previous, what revelations of mind in the first three sections was building up to was this moment where we recognize mm. and become conceptual. Mm -hmm. And it was pointing out that this projection of a unit of time, which is very much the theme of the previous section, mm -hmm. is, a, is a key event in a recognitive process that creates a known world with me and time. Mm -hmm. I it creates the narrated experience of me in the world. Mm -hmm. And that recognitive process takes time and is in time. Now, the question is, takes time from what and what was before it? And the answer is big U understanding. So it's not that we actually go from small U to big U. Mm -hmm. We stop small Uing. And oh. if we're stable enough, okay. what, we're, yeah. what we're left with is big U. <laughs> I, big U was always there. OK. So it's actually a not doing. Yeah. Terrible. I like that to stop small Uing. Yeah. I have to write that one down. <laughs> And so, then, that, then that allows the big U understanding. Yeah, to, and that's um, why I use sports metaphor a lot. Hmm. Because when a sportsman is in a really intense event, like maybe they're in a tennis match or something, hmm. they'll break through into absolute engagement. Mm -hmm. And it's totally enthralling for the audience. Yeah. Because what's happened is they've broken through the narrative into a totally engaged state, yeah. which is big U understanding. Or when a performer breaks through into live performance, again, you see that moment where, wham, suddenly they're no longer themselves. They're totally in whatever they're doing. And that's completely enthralling. We all have an intuition, a taste for it. We just don't know what it is that we like. So audiences love this experience. And then at the end of it, they applaud and walk away without realizing that what they were applauding was exactly that capacity of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we never ever find it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, same with hang gliding, bungee jumping, mm -hmm. any kind of exhilaration, all break through narrative structure into absolute mm -hmm. experience. And what the difference in the Buddhist path is about is realizing that this um, breakthrough actually is available in normal experience if you know what it is mm -hmm. and that's what the whole subject of revel that that is the revelation of mind actually that, mm -hmm. that's it that, that's mm -hmm. the revelation of mind mm -hmm. yeah. this is really helpful richard thank you so much yeah this is real good stuff i'm, I'm glad i hit the record button because i'll probably watch this again myself <laughs> you're really helping me okay shall i read on uh, yeah, maybe uh, Chris would like to read that. Yeah, that's good. Sure, except that I've been so engaged by Richard, I lost track of where we are. Roy. Page uh, 59. Yes. Right after Rinpoche with the paragraph that says the next time. Aye, aye. aye. Oh, wait, in wait, did we do that? Did we do that? Oh, no, we did that one. Is that okay for you guys? No, we did, it. We did that one. Go on okay. down to the very bottom and tell us what Rinpoche has to say. Okay. My volume's okay. Yeah. While it may seem impossible at this point to engage time in a way that would transform ingrained patterns of perception and response, we can still question the powerful processes that construct our reality and limit our ability to experience new possibilities for thought and action. Mm -hmm. Even a few steps in this direction can reveal a gateway to new ways of understanding. Just doing this, <clears throat> even if we do it only a few times a day, can have a significant effect on our pattern responses. We are in effect giving a new instruction to our mind. The approach is to turn directly to face the display maker and ask, 
Who is saying this? What's going on here? How is this manifesting? Just doing this has a major consequence. Mm. While our situation now is completely locked in, supported by language and logic, understanding may work in subtle ways that do not rely upon lo logical structures of conceptual thought. Perhaps through our senses, imagination, feelings, or thoughts, we have already picked up enough understanding to appreciate the value of questioning some fundamental assumptions. If, if so, it will become easier to identify what we do not yet understand and invite to arise. Mr. Dixie, any help with this last paragraph? I mean, I'm sure as the book goes on, you explain it, but. Well, actually, I, the comment I make directly afterwards is I think the key, the world that we perceive all around is an inferred entity entangled with our innate capacity to know. Now, this is a really important statement. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Because we infer the world. Remember, we don't experience anything other than the inputs of our senses and thoughts. From those inputs, we make an inference about an external thing outside of us, which we never experience. We never experience what comes through our, our, our senses. And it's confirmed by our interactions with other people. It's entirely inferential. And that is entangled with innate knowing, innate intelligence, whatever you want to call it. And our job is to disentangle the inferred from the direct. And they're always present together. If there was no direct knowing, there'd be no knowing. And this is the thing about machine learning or so-called artificial intelligence, that intelligence is different from information. You can have any amount of information, but be completely stupid. And indeed, machine learning is a very good example. You know, it takes a baby five attempts to recognize a face. The best machine learning devices take between two and 10,000. They need a huge amount of data yeah. to make the machine learning work. It's the same phenomenon. It's because it's not intelligent. And this is the point. So our intelligence, our natural intelligence is always non-conceptual and is always present. It is actually our intelligence, but it's entangled with inferences that are not seen. They're hidden. And because of that, we land up making dumb mistakes, doing stupid shit, going in circles mm -hmm. because we are muddled up. It's confused. What this is literally what's meant by ignorance. Mm -hmm. And the word for ignorance in Tibetan is marigpa, rigpa being primordial intelligence and marigpa being not primordially intelligent, <laughs> literally that. And so it, Rimshay talks about all pervasive misunderstanding a lot. Yeah, I'm not sure if you come to it yet. I'm not sure where it gets. You, it will turn up. Okay. And it's the same thing. It's because we misunderstand the conditioning and the conditioning is another word for entanglement, mm -hmm. the pollution of our natural intelligence by unconscious inference. Mm -hmm. And consequently, people will fight each other over inferences, which they're both making. <laughs> Instead of going, geez, we're both making inferences, let's chill. No, no, they freaking fight as if they're real. And that's a very, you know, so look at this madness in Ukraine, a very good example of this craziness. And that kind of thing happens a lot. In fact, from a Buddhist perspective, one would say all suffering as suffering is due to this. There is pain and old age and death, but what makes them suffering is this inferential structure that causes people to agonize over things they needn't agonize over. And so this is a very, very big, and again, one of these pervasive themes that runs through the second half of Revelations and is only really um, approachable if the first half of Revelations has been studied. 
because mm -hmm. it's like it's like relaxing your shoulders. If, if you're going to relax your shoulders, you have to tense them and then relax them. Yeah. And what happens in the first half of Revelations is an exhaustive study of conceptuality. Mm -hmm. It's essentially trying to give a complete map of how we infer a world and the process by which we infer that world. And so the first half of Revelations is really very conceptual, but it's conceptual in a very precise way. It's not just, just conceptual. It's, it's conceptual about inferential perception. And then the second half of Revelations is all about learning to drop it because we know what it is. One of the big objections to the bookshelf in mm. books about mind and life is they're full of books about enlightenment and cognitive freedom and happiness and all this stuff, but nobody knows what it is they're meant to stop doing. So what they end up doing is taking their inferential confusion mm. and incorporating into it words like enlightenment and all the rest of it as if somehow that's going to work. And of course it doesn't. They just land up with a new language of confusion. Mm -hmm. Now it's a religious language of confusion, whereas before it wasn't. And that's completely and utterly pointless. So this again is why uh, Revelations of Mind is so unusual, because in many ways it's the book of books. Mm -hmm. It's saying, hey, pretty much all the books <laughs> you've ever read about the ultimate state of well-being, happiness, nirvana, whatever you want to call it, liberation, blah, 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 will mislead you. Not because they intend to, but because you will mislead yourself if you don't understand unconscious conceptuality. <laughs> they are totally useless. Um, you're not going to get anywhere. So, you know, that, that's, that's one of the big messages of Revelations of Mind, really. If, if you have an understanding or an experience uh, of this unconscious um, inference process, um, and you, you, you recognize it for what it is, can you still get benefit from some of these spiritual books? Or of course, maybe? once once you yeah. once you um, have seen it, yeah, then it's like a Rosetta Stone. Then you read these books and go, oh, wow, that's what they're talking about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like one of the one of the books I, <laughs> I love to give groups is a yeah. book called The Cloud of Unknowing. Do you know that? Oh, book? I love that. Yes. Well, yeah. you read The Cloud of Unknowing, and what the yeah. guy is saying is. You know, God is beyond concept, essentially. You have to yeah. approach the divine right. through a non-conceptual path. Yeah. And even a moment yeah. of big you understanding is highly transformative like that. Right. Because it, what, it, it, what it shows the cognitive structure, it kind of demonstrates the cognitive mm -hmm. structure, mm -hmm. is that there is another way. Because the cognitive structure tends to get very stuck in its conceptuality. And so even brief glimpses mm -hmm. of another way. And this is why exhilaration is so important in people's experience. I mean, Alan on his boat when it's, you know, freaking keeled over in a big wind. Whoa! And then that freedom, wow. that sense of freedom yeah. um, is very trying. It, pervade, it, <clears throat> it pervades conceptuality. Mm -hmm. And once you understand why it pervades conceptuality, mm -hmm. you can systematic in inviting it into your experience mm -hmm. i.e you make what the buddhists call a path mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you suddenly realize oh my god i haven't even started yet this is the beginning of the path it's to introduce non-conceptuality into my experience deliberately that is the path knowing it uh, yeah knowing but of course it. knowing what it is but of yeah. course, until you you've discovered it, you haven't even begun. All you're doing is milling about. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like guys trying to start the marathon. They're just running around in circles. Then yeah. they're, they're going to run off. And it, until you, well, you you understand what it is you're doing, you haven't even well, begun. Yeah. And you know, I've I've had people. I mean, I'm in the same boat. God Almighty! I started studying Buddhism in 1973, mm -hmm. and I only really started making any progress. I think about five years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just running in circles, getting educated. Mm -hmm. accumulating a lot of information mm -hmm. but not actually making any progress yeah because mm -hmm. i didn't know what it was i was trying to do mm -hmm. and so i think this is a very very important idea this mm -hmm. oh thank you <laughs> Can we carry on 
Alan, do you want to read? Or yeah, where come? did we leave off on uh, page uh, 61? Yeah. Yeah, the world we perceive. It was that quote, wasn't it? It's page 60, the middle. In the middle. Uh, yeah, the first thing I said, the world we perceive all around us. And that's in 60. He said, um, the capacity of the mind is limited, understanding it. I don't see where we'll. we'll page, oh, yes, page 60, paragraph one, two, three. Okay, got it. Well, our situation now is completely locked in. Support by language and logic. Understanding may work in subtle ways, but do not rely upon the logical structure of the thought. Perhaps, though, through our senses, imagination, feelings, or thoughts, we have already picked up enough understanding to appreciate the value of questioning some of fundamental assumptions. If so, it will become easier to identify what we do not yet understand and invite understanding to arise. The world that we perceive all around us is an inferred entity entangled with our innate capacity to know. It's a system of interaction with other people, with shared culture and societal, societal structures, politics and economics. It's a highly organized and self-referential construct. Only certain things are possible with such a structure. Understanding, however, is the direct expression of our knowing prior to the inferential construction of the world. It is subtle, quiet, but totally per pervasive. It's always there to prior to inferential construction, always present. Just by allowing ourselves a moment to acknowledge it as enormous consequence, we are relying on understanding. Well, the Christians would call this grace. There's actually a lot of parallels between Buddhist understanding of non-dual cognition and the writings of the Christian masters of the Northern Renaissance. Um, I don't know if you know, there were two renaissances mm -hmm. and the northern renaissance, the so-called Gothic renaissance of the 11th and 12th century, the early renaissance, produced these writers who were talking about the eternal and the present, mm -hmm. like Robert Grosser Test and, and, and Roger Bacon. Mm -hmm. And they talked about grace in this way, the grace of God. And it was this ease of direct knowing. Now, of course, Buddhists don't reify gods anywhere, but actually the, the god that these guys were talking about was definitely not a guy with a long white beard, that's for certain. Um, they were talking about states of mind which are very, very similar to what we would call non-dual cognition and using language that's perfectly comprehensible as non-dual cognition. So I suspect that actually is what they were talking about. Um, and. Uh, they're very interesting, the Northern Renaissance writers. Beautiful. Um, and of course, they produce these exquisite buildings. Um, these Gothic cathedrals are just exquisite. And when you go into them, you can see that they are creating this sense, this numinosity of experience. Um, absolutely exquisite. Um, so I, I mention that because in the Christian tradition, um, in this way, it's a very interesting parallel to these teachings. Who, who, could you mention one or two authors from that period? Yeah, Robert Grossetest, G-R-O-S-E-T-E-S-T, E, Grossetest, Bishop of Lincoln. Okay. Wrote some absolutely amazing stuff. <laughs> and another one is Roger Bacon. Okay. Not Francis Bacon, this is Roger Bacon. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are, there was one guy, unfortunately we have only little bits, called Duns Scotus, who was quite clearly a Zogchen master of some sort, because, yeah. it, it, you know, he's, he was famous for people kind of coming out of his seminars and having to go and lie down. You know, it, it, he was so extraordinary. So it was a very, very interesting period, very theological but not in the heavy, flat-footed, boring way that yeah. theology developed. Mm. Very mystical, very interesting, this period. I wonder if uh, some of the uh, 
Christian mystics like Julian of Norwich and uh, I thought I'm forgetting another, but we're of that period too. Now they're a little bit earlier, basically very early, you're Julian of Norwich and the, the woman, there's a woman. Um, Chris, uh, Teresa of Avila. Yeah, those, I think some of those people are a little earlier. There was a there was a strong anchorite tradition in Christ. Basically, early Christianity was yogic. You know, mm. the anchorites they used to sit on frigging pillars and stuff. Yeah, and they they were seeking to again exhaust their referential structure through hardship and enter this mystical communion with the Godhead. Mm -hmm. And so it was highly mystical, really, mm. very very strongly so. Early Christianity. Yeah. Um, and then it got institutionalized, and of course we didn't know much about the Dark Ages. Yeah. But then they discovered Plato and the Northern Renaissance is a discovery of Plato. And with the Platonic world came this incredible engagement with non-duality. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a theme in Platonism. It's interesting. And mm -hmm. then the Southern Renaissance was the discovery of Aristotle, logic and far more dense, mm -hmm. really, uh, Christianity emerged from it. Mm -hmm. But the Northern period is absolutely wonderful. And some mm -hmm. of those writers are really worth reading. Mm -hmm. what, what we know, obviously, they're translating him from Latin. You know, there are questions mm -hmm. as to how academic yeah. stuff. But certainly that book, The Cloud of Unknown, comes from that period, too. Oh, it's, that's that was my next question. 12th Thanks. century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know the author. Century, before, yeah. the Black, before the Black Death. Yeah, we know it was a monk, a monk from a certain monastery, but we don't know the author. We, we know because no one ever signed anything. You see, yeah. what's so interesting about yeah. all this early period is that people were going beyond their identity mm -hmm. into some absolute state in which personal identity wasn't important. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely rare to have any ascriptions of anything mm -hmm. because they simply didn't, you know, auth authorize anything because they didn't feel it was theirs. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, a totally different yeah. mindset. And there's only one book I know about the early medieval and it's extremely interesting. It's called Through a Glass Darkly hmm. by um, an author I can't remember. And it's about the, the, the Knights of Corsi, which is a, a, a baronetcy in France. And for, there is a biography of this particular baronetcy. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely interesting. It's called, oh, Elizabeth Tuckman. Okay. E U C H M A N. It's called Through a Glass Darkly. And it sees into the medieval world. Okay. And you realize this is a world where people did not have personal identity, as we understand it. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And they knew when they were going to die. So, for example, people would write voluminous wills, pages long, I mean, really detailed, and then die. I mean, you know, it was as if they, they were, it's something that we find hard to understand. How yeah. they would do this. Um, <laughs> and they had a very different conception of reality, the, 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 the modernity that we experience. But I think in many ways, in the light of revelations, you suddenly go, wow, these people were really very different. And that I think is something that we lost in Western culture. I think the Black Death basically destroyed a very high culture and it never recovered, essentially. The Western culture went on its way and has been enormously powerful and successful, but I think it lost a key which I think many ways, the contribution of these Asian, Asian wisdom traditions is repairing. That's really one way of seeing this. Um, and I often, I often talk about Nicholas Aresmi, another feature, another figure from this period, um, who graphically illustrates this idea. He wrote a book on mechanics for the King Francis II, I think, of France in about the 12th century. 1230 or something, I mean, 1130 or 1150 or something, about, about that mm -hmm. period. And he writes this paradigmatic book on mechanics. And there are three examples that are examined. One is the rolling of a ball down an inclined plane. Well, okay, that's mechanical. The second one is the ripening of an apple. <laughs> kind of mechanical. The third one is the movement of grace in the heart. Mm. Wow. All in one book on mechanics. Wow. Now that really is interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, I'm gonna look at that. see a distinction <clears throat> yeah. in the rolling of a ball and the ripening and, and the movement of grace. Mm. They were all mechanical. And to me, that's fascinating and shows non-duality in action. These people weren't 
separating themselves from their environment like we do. They were living in a very different conception of the world. Um, so it's very fascinating. You know, uh, I sometimes think that a lot of indigenous uh, uh, communities, you know, been on their own in different places that have arrived to some of this stuff uh, in a very clear way. Uh, I read something when I came down, we stopped at, uh, at Fort Ross and uh, there was some wonderful thing. I forgot to take a picture of it. Uh, but it was just this wonderful thing about how they were, how they saw reality and how they lived. And it was what you're talking about. Uh, it was not like uh, we're individual people. We are one, we are one. And well, it's not, it's not that they arrived at it. They never left it. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, yeah. you, got, you got the point. But that was yeah, a, yeah. A, a natives of that area. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it was just so touching. I'm going to go back there to get get that, and mm -hmm. I don't know why I, I didn't take a picture of it when I was there. I couldn't remember it, but it was very much what you're talking about right now. Well, later on, <laughs> later on in this book, I do quote Chief Seattle. Oh, uh, yes. And because again, you know, it's quite clear that the Chief Seattle. That there's a moment that comes up. I forget where, but anyway, the Congress decides they want to buy his land, and he writes this letter. To Congress says, I can't sell you the land because I don't own it. Wow. It's the most yeah. beautiful letter, honestly. It's just wow. like, who are you people? You nuts! You know, <laughs> what are you trying to do? And and uh, so I do quote that letter at length. I, I think it's fascinating when you see native people that their attitude to the, their environment and themselves is just so at odds yeah. with our modern conception. And again, the Tibetan culture is a traditional shamanistic culture, absolutely. Um, and you know, there there is actually very strong genetic evidence that the Tibetans are the origins of the American Indians. That essentially, American Indian Tibetan oh, wow. tribes uh, mm -hmm. migrated over the Bering Straits into into North America, and about fifteen thousand to twenty thousand BC, when it was frozen, mm -hmm. and genetically, they have very strong markers, similar between American Indians and Tibetans. And the four directions of the shamanistic four directions are found in Tibetan Buddhism in Tantra. Same four directions are very, very similar. So quite clearly a very strong continuity between the cultural roots. That's very interesting. Yeah. I have a book here about the shamanism, uh, Divine Messengers, uh, for untold story of the Bhutan's female shamans. There you go. And it's a fascinating book. I don't know if you know about this, Richard. I don't know that one, but I mean, there are many of them. I mean, there are many, mm. many shamanistic subcultures. Mm. It, yeah, it was just, I, I know the lady who wrote it, and I went to her uh, book thing, book, uh, and I never thought about it, but I read it, and it's just amazing about what you're saying. Uh, of course, the other thing which is fascinating, and it's completely off the point, I'm going to mention it. So many of these weird American religious cults are actually combinations of Christianity and shamanism. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Mormonism, where is is an example of this, where where Jacob Smith has a vision quest experience in an American Indian holy site, and then re receives teachings in the four directions, mm -hmm. and there is absolutely no question at all uh -oh. that he was copying, either deliberately or unconsciously, American Indian vision quests. Um, and the Shakers are another example of this. And that's because in the colonization of America, there was a 250 year period where settlers and American Indians were marrying mm -hmm. and were developing culture together. And because it's antebellum, mm -hmm. we've forgotten it. Mm -hmm. It's as if it's a hidden history. Mm -hmm. But the, the history of the first 200 years of settlement of North America is one of integration between European Christianity and American Indian shamanism. And you get these strange Christian cults in America, nowhere else in the world do they exist. And it's because it is that influence that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it then develops in its own bonkers way, as yeah. <laughs> that always happens. But, but nonetheless, <clears throat> the actual roots are fascinating. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And somehow it turns into QAnon. <laughs> yeah, well, you can see really why it's part of the uniqueness of America, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah. This strange thing. Good. The QAnon, yeah. Yeah, wow. Shall we read on? Yeah, please. Okay. 
I kind of forgot where I left off, but let's see. Uh, Even a glimpse. Is that, I mean, uh, let's see. Numerous experiences. Yeah. Numerous experiences one has with great works of art, music, or architecture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Works that almost glow beyond the physical capture this quality of understanding better than any words. When you spend time with great works of art, time stops. It's almost as if you don't belong in history. That's because they're coming from a place that's prior to history and concept. Exactly the same way we're not in the world that is displayed to us, displayed to us. Mm -hmm. But we forget ourselves in our moment to moment world making. This attitude of turning around and saying, why, who are you? has the power to introduce a new way of being into our stream of experience and make our life work a profound expression rather than a flat routine. Understanding that we have opportunities to reshape our views and perspective is the most precious gift, it's the most, the most precious of gifts, knowing that we can operate our lives with real choice, that we can exercise mastery without having to be the master. We find that patterns associated with the need to assert control begin to drop away. So yes, it's, um, I, I relate to this uh, particular art part of it. Music, if you take music without words, particularly uh, old masters, and there's no, there's, there's just feelings, there's just, uh, uh, experiences. Uh, how mm -hmm. can you? I mean, unless unless you're, or, or, and, and and I think uh, Newcomb would know more because he's he's a he's a musician. And uh, but that's one thing I think. Also, so many ways are like that mm -hmm. in our lives if we know this. <clears throat> yeah. mm -hmm. So I I find that uh, the thing about art to be wonderful, and I do a little bit of art. I am lost in my art. It's gone. I know, Roy, you have the same. We've talked about the same feelings. It, you're just gone. It's just there. And uh, uh, it's another way to experience this. Uh, mm -hmm. We call it a big view or a big uh, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it's it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what they, what they, being in the zone? Yeah. Isn't that word. sort of furry? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the zone of without having knowledge of any particular thing in your mind. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously in the zone is exactly inner learning. I mean, what makes a great artist is when they're able to express in a way that is beyond any concept, but everybody gets it. Mm -hmm. Now they really stand out. I mean, any artist can express beyond concept, but the yeah. great ones have developed yeah. an aesthetic sense Mm -hmm. which we come on to later on in Revelations, which is so developed that although there are no words or concepts associated with their work, it, they are completely entrancing. And there's a wonderful word that I use, I think, somewhere in the book called numinous. I love the word numinous. Art is numinous. And so when you see a great art, like a Cezanne or something, you just can't avoid it. It just won't let you walk past even though it's nothing mm -hmm. much, it's just a thing on the wall, but somehow, wow, it just captures you completely. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, in, in the UK, there was a, a minor stately home that was open on Thursdays. And, I, you know, because they have to do this to get tax breaks. So it was pouring with rain and I stopped my car, went to this house. I was the only person in it. And they had a tiny Rembrandt. Oh. In the corner on a wall. Yeah. Like a shrine. My God, it was ridiculous. It was just, they, they weren't making a big deal out of it. It was just, you know, there it was, one of the yeah. Rembrandt self portraits. Uh -huh. Jesus, it was following me around. It was crazy. <laughs> the, the, the power of this, this object. Mm -hmm. um, I was completely on my own. There was nobody there, not even an attendant. I could have stolen it, actually. It was just sitting there. But the effect it was having, mm -hmm. and this thing is beyond time. It has no mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. because it's made beyond time. It, it's out of time. Mm -hmm. And one of the tragedies of modern art is it's become conceptual. So what artists try to do now is communicate. 
And of course, communication is absolutely in time, which is why so much of modern art, sadly, I'm not talking about Picassos of the world. I'm talking about really the 20th, 20th century. You could say postmodern art, really, um, is attempting to, con to say things about current conditions like commentary. And of course, those things are absolutely in time. They're going to have a. They're going to be of zero interest, apart from anthropological interest, in a hundred years' time, because they're not beyond time. Whereas great works of art are literally out of time. They could be any time. It doesn't matter. Well, Nothing I think what, what you're saying is particularly true for like Andy Warhol pieces, but I'll submit that some <clears throat> some abstract art. Oh no, I'm, I love abstract art. Yeah. I'm not talking about abstract it's, art. Yeah, when it, yeah, okay, thank you. Because I think that uh, clearly, particularly some of the uh, late 20th century, the 70s, 60s, 80s period, Joan Mitchell and others, sure. I, could on, I could go on and on, that they do grab you. And you may not oh, even yeah. know, and you may not even know why, but they're exactly. compelling. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I did, no, no, I'm, I'm absolutely into it. I, you know, one of the most formative experiences for me when I was younger was the Tate Gallery. Put on a show it was oh, mind so beautiful i love that place well they put on this show that was the origins of cubism mm -hmm. and they collected pre-cubist mm -hmm. brack and picasso mm -hmm. and cubist brack and picasso together oh Only time it's ever been done so there was a like yeah. maybe a hundred pieces between these two artists and you could see how abstract art developed because they had the pre the representational works of both master and then how they gradually develop the language of cubism it completely opened my eyes to abstract art before then i hadn't really understood it but once you get into it mm -hmm. then you suddenly realize wow these things are really something um and so yeah absolutely no, I, i'm not talking i'm talking about yeah. you know when they hang a raincoat on the wall and there's some you know yeah, yeah. curated piece of crap yeah. about why this is saying something about our current circumstance yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff that, that to me is uh, the yeah. other area is a uh, uh, modern uh, modern dance. Uh, I, I'm particularly fond of uh, uh, the modern dance of uh, in, in San Francisco uh, and uh, 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 lines uh, is a great one. And, and they do this stuff, and it's it, it's it's just you can't really explain any of it, and it is not really a story. It's you just you just there and you just experience Alonzo King and uh, Lyons modern ballet, and I've been a fan for many years uh, of his work. And just for that reason, there is no story. But it's saying something. It somehow it says something. And uh, saying I mean, other classical ball ballets is wonderful, but they always have a little story behind them. Chris, what do you th got something in mind? I, I do. I have a question for Richard regarding what we were just discussing with numinous experiences. And part of my vocabulary and study has been on what Maslow and others have termed peak experiences. Can you share anything on, on your definition of peak experience and how it relates to your book? Yeah, yeah, I can. I, I think if I've understood peak experience, and I'm, forgive me, I, I haven't studied Maslow enough to really be precise, but I think a peak experience is an experience that's inherently beyond concept because it is literally a peak experience. Mm -hmm. So you go, you sort of blow through your conceptual experience into this engaged experience that is beyond concept. Um, I think that's what's meant by a peak experience. Um, and if, if, I, if I'm, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is that what, what you're referring to, Chris? Yes, exactly. I stepped off an 80 foot cliff above a pond when I was 17. Yeah. And I knew that I was going to be okay, even though my brain screamed, you just killed yourself, kid. Yeah, that's right. I was fine. You know, yeah. I was better fine when I came up. But yes, and, and that changes you forever because yes. understanding with a capital U has been introduced nakedly into your conceptual world map. And it is lit the proverbial stranger in the village. Because what's actually happening, it's like God turning up and saying, actually, I own this. You know, <laughs> I, I remember once when I was working for the Department of Medical Electronics in uh, St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. We had this department. We were all happily working together. We had a professor who was head of department. And then one day this guy turned up in a suit and said, 
I'm actually closing this down. This whole department, you're all fired. And we suddenly realized that we weren't in a little world and this guy was the head of it. There was someone above us. We never realized. Well, it's a bit like that. If understanding with a capital U is a complete creator of the entire conceptual framework, but because it never turns up, the conceptual framework appears to be complete. But when it does, the conceptual framework is never the same. Because actually the creator showed its face just for a moment. And from then onwards, your life is different. Yeah. And so that's why peak experiences are so transformative. <laughs> because suddenly you realize, oh my God, there's a bit more here than I thought. Now, of course, a great artist not only engages with that, but expresses it. And that to me is what makes a great artist. So a Vermeer, I mean, God knows what state Vermeer was in when he was painting those things, but he captured something beyond eternity. I, I'm sure even aliens yeah. would look at Vermeers and get it. The and girl with a, the pearl oh, earring. Oh yeah. God, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. those paintings are just ridiculously good. Yeah. And that skill is the, the real skill of an artist. And there's a very interesting debate between Picasso and Brack Mm. Uh, Picasso and Matisse about this. Now, Picasso wanted to say art always had to have a meaning. And Matisse said, no, it can just be decorative. Mm -hmm. And what Matisse was talking about was this, that just in and of itself, it doesn't have to say anything. Mm -hmm. It will say something if it's well done. It was a very, very interesting debate they were having about the function of art. And to me, great art is a reminder of the non-conceptual. And if it's done well, it literally forces you yeah. into non-conceptual relationship with it, which is its function. And so you land and so that's why it's so prized. I remember there was a Ming vase in the British Museum Oriental collection for a while. And I used to go in there and have Darshan with it. It was just in a, well, just in a, you know, glass-fronted cabinet, like with a load of other stuff. But this Ming vase, honestly, I don't know why it was. It, I was just enthralled by it. Mm -hmm. God, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just hang out with it for twenty minutes mm -hmm. because it was so perfect. The execution of it was so perfect. Hard to tell what it was that was doing it, but whoever made that thing was a great, great master. Mm -hmm. And there it was. It wasn't decorated cer uh, ceramic mm -hmm. so that's the function of art. i do have one quick question about something that's kind of been a kind of thinking about here sure. like you mentioned you mentioned prior about essentially you're talking about how some of these like artists can get into like the like call it the zone you could say about how they are in this like kind of like trans like trans life state right about how they're like in it, it goes beyond comprehension that kind of yeah, my that, following that, yeah but don't call it trance like I know, there's always a okay. tendency in our from from the point of view of conceptuality non-conceptuality has to be zombie like because it has gotcha. no words therefore you have to be in some kind of trance actually what you're in is a state of total clarity gotcha not trance like idea. at all it's complete <laughs> clarity <Gotcha. laughs> but i just want to correct that because it's important yeah okay so then like that 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 state of clarity of like just being like we call it like being in the zone where you're like you're just kind of moving like you know what you're doing but you don't i guess you could say at the same time isn't that the, and isn't that the same idea as big you though is that it like, is identical like? identical it is. so okay. the zone is where you and what you're doing become one Ah, so like when you're there's, like focusing in on something and you're like, and it's just like everything else goes away. There's nothing, there's no, there's, uh, I like the idea of the, the, there's no instructions, you could say. Well, yeah, now, oh. there's, okay, so there's two, there's two varieties to this. There's concentration where you disappear into a task, which is like the zone, but actually isn't the zone. Hmm. And then That'd there's be... what lies beyond that, where suddenly you find your state of concentration has no task it's just concentration and then you're in the zone ah okay so the zone okay. is beyond an object it sometimes it's called a shamata without an object objectless shamata so whereas shamata is normally you and it 
which is inherently dualistic because of course you're concentrating on something when you enter the zone you go beyond concentration into what i think you could call performance i your action becomes performative you're no longer doing something for something you and what you're doing are one sometimes it's called a state of unification which is why what that's what that's what it means you you become unified you have if you like crystallized into a total state of being and of course what's actually happened is the commentator who is inherently dualistic saying i am doing this has been transcended into just doing yeah brain Do like brain is anymore. Brain. yes <laughs> gotcha okay so and then out of curiosity too because there was something that uh where was it here it was, it was talking about instruction like the the instruction somewhere like uh, i think it was on the page prior wait a minute but i was looking at that like the instructions of how like we look at like when you look at something the instruction is like oh that's you know that's a that's a pillow that's a that's a you know that's a glass of water or something like that Essentially, if, if I'm following correctly, those instructions are half the reason we say in little you. So, so I didn't catch that there, what? Oh, I said the, 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 these instructions of like, this is what this thing is, is the reason why we stay in uh, uh, small you, small you using uniform. Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah um, it, is that the instructions. Sense? So you, you mean, when I, I do say somewhere that recognitive naming is both identifying things and identifying what they mean is that what what you're referring to i just want to make sure i'm understood you could you breaking up a little bit so. oh sorry uh let me see if i can find it here and i can yeah, bring dude, it back up there, there the... we can be precise most um, definitely instruction I have it here. Well, did we read it today yeah we, we read it, it in the last sounds uh... good, but... what's that chris it sounds to sort of like can you hear me yes yep can oh, anybody oh. hear me yeah we, yep. can hear you. Yeah. we can hear you but my thing is not greening around it so i i didn't know if i was being heard but it sounds like we're inter uh, approaching inferences again well are you getting talking close about paragraph, to inf it's a paragraph one at the top of page 60 instruction to our mind is that what you're referring to Ah, yep, yep. So it's the, yeah, so that's that paragraph one. It's like the the yeah. pattern, the 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 we can have a significant effect on our pattern, our, our pattern responses. Yeah, we effectively giving new instructions to our mind. Yeah, the way the way that I kind of looking at that is like the instruction is what we essentially ref like what we see, like what um how do I put this? Um, oh goodness, ah. Uh, The instructions that we have, so when we look at an object or, or we act a certain way, like, you know, like, oh, like, like this thing pisses me off or something like that. That's, I'm looking at that, like that, like that whole action, that whole reference that we're taking to the mind where we're looking at it and we're associating, oh, this thing pisses me off as an instruction. Is okay, that... th that's not quite what I mean here, though. I agree with okay. you. That is an instruction. So okay. all emotions are learned. So we meet someone who annoys us. And there is an immediate rising of an instruction. I don't like this guy. Hmm. And if you don't catch it, you're on the you're off on the wrong foot. That that that's true. The instruction I'm referring to here is rather different. It's the instruction that we can generate knowing without concept. Now I'll give you a very good example. Oh. Now I'll give you an example. If you say, and it's just an exercise. So go and stand in front of an object, say a rose bush but don't name it. Now, normally what happens is <laughs> whenever we stand in front of an object, we go, oh, that's a rose bush. And all of our rose bush stuff is produced. It's prickly, it smells nice, blah, 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 whatever. We've got a whole bunch of information about rose bushes, which then gets produced for us as a map reference. And suddenly we're in a conceptual relationship with the rose bush. I want you to just be there with the rose bush give get and see what happens now whenever big you understanding arises 
we're literally giving permission and instruction for non-dual cognition to manifest. And what tends to happen is, when we stand in front of an object and try to know it without words, our conceptual apparatus says, oh, you, know, you can't do that, you're wasting your time, what are you talking, trying to be mystical, you know, all this critical doubt voice comes up, because of course, that's what it is. If you do this, it's out of business. It's going to have to tell you this isn't going to work because if it does work, it's out of business. So it's going to tell you it's not going to work. And it's a matter of giving an instruction. So, no, this could work. Now, this is a negotiation because the regime of mind is protective. Something I'm sure has come up a lot now in your reading of this book. And it is a nanny that he's saying, don't go out at night because you're going to get into trouble and blah, blah, all this bloody advice. And it's nannying us around because it's kept us alive and it you know, keeps us out of trouble and all the rest of it. So when you start introducing something that goes beyond the regime of mind into the regime of mind, it will always say, my God, you, should, you can't do this. You mustn't do this, it's too dangerous. And that's so you have to give an instruction. And so part of the benefit of even a few glimpses of non-dual cognition is that it, it 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 gives this instruction that yes there's another way you can be and the exercise i say is to stand in front of a known object but don't name it and you're going to find your regime goes nuts so like, oh, i want to tell you about this thing i want to tell you what this is <laughs> See, no, i'm not interested in your opinion <laughs> <What a pain. laughs> without you <laughs> and you're going to find yourself getting quite it's a very interesting experience and that's the instruction i'm referring to in that paragraph if you look at the paragraph you see that's what it's actually saying gotcha i was because i was curious cause going back to like getting it like it seems like you have to do that before you can get into the zone the, the zone. no no you don't actually no you're not going to get into the zone like that you're going to get okay. into the zone by accident because what's going to happen is you're going to be so familiar with conceptuality that eventually you're going to say, I understand this whole thing, but who is understanding it? Now, remember, you, I don't know if you remember oh, those. Okay. You remember those, um, uh, you, you get these childhood puzzles where you, you, pat, you, you, you fill in all the spaces and then suddenly a negative image is left that's not filled in. And so suddenly you get something that you didn't know was there. <laughs> well, that's it. It's the same thing. The one thing that's not conceptual is the conceptualizer. This goes back to Gödel. It goes back to Gödel's proof. The one thing that cannot be conceptual, the one premise in any conceptual argument is the beginning of it, which in our, in our experiential sense is the knower, the experiencer. But the experiencer is only ever known if the conceptual structure that's being experienced is fully understood, then by default, the non-dual becomes visible. But as long as there are gaps in the conceptual understanding, it'll never happen. And so this is one of the reasons why reifying words like enlightenment is so unhelpful. Because what it does is situate enlightenment in the conceptual. When, of course, it's non-conceptual, it's not in the map at all. And <laughs> gotcha. so what we have to do is totally understand conceptuality, conceptually. And finally, we'll get to land's limits. Searcher will reach land's limits. And what happens then is the magical thing. Non-conceptuality becomes visible by default. And gotcha. that's that why the books call that. That's the, that's the existential moment that occurs in this section of Revelations of Mind, funnily enough. Yeah, when this occurs. And having seen it, like a genie in the bottle, having seen it, then it's a matter of, well, how do I make this happen again? What, what am I doing here? And a whole long process, which is really the path begins to become doable. Because you've suddenly smelt the roses I know there are roses out there somewhere. They're just not in the map of roses. They're somewhere else. 
And so suddenly you've got a lodestone you can follow. And just like a great artist who must have started out discovering the non-conceptual and then gradually, like Vermeer, gradually developed their art until they could express it totally. We, in our own experience, can discover the non-conceptual and then develop it like a craftsman. So our own perception becomes our art. If you like, our life becomes a performance. We are totally in the zone. And I've only met one person who was in who's like that. But literally everywhere they went, they were in the center of events. Everything revolved around them. It was ridiculous. And yet they were never flustered. They were never freaked out. They were never late for anything. Nothing like that ever happened. It was just something about where they were. And that is literally, technically, that is the complete purity of shamatha. You're completely embodied. You have totally arrived. Yeah. And so, of course, that's the destination. That's the revelation of mind. Go back. Yeah. This is a cause me, doesn't it, to recall and think about uh, 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 Tolle. Uh, his first name. I forgot his first name. Eckhart Tolle. Oh, Tolle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so Eckhart Tolle. And, yeah. and, 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 and in sense of this, this non-conceptual presence, I would, I'm going to say, I'm going to assert, can only mm -hmm. happen in this very moment. Of course, it and, can't happen anywhere else. And, and that, that once you begin to rely on the conceptual and all of this indirect experience and inferential experience, you're actually drawing on the past. You're no yeah. longer in the moment. Well, be careful here because yeah. you're using this phrase, the moment, oh. which of course is conceptual. Because remember that what you're really talking about is the fourth time. Yeah. Time that doesn't have any time. Mm -hmm. It, the, you know, the, the whole problem with the language of, I, yeah. I, I, I haven't read much Tolle, but there is, that's the only drawback is the yeah. very attempt to talk about this thing, rarefies it into the three times. And what we're really talking about is what lies beyond the three times. Mm -hmm. um, I see your point. Yeah, because yeah. he is, he is talking about. Um, I'm, I'm not criticizing Tolle. No, 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 I, I think, that, I, I, I I think that these, these teachers come at this from different points of view, and it's all yeah. constructive if you're yeah, yeah. If, if you if know you're what you're able doing. to see it with the unconscious. <laughs> yeah, but the key is, I mean, the key to this whole thing is our inferential mapping is entangling our direct knowing, and it's doing so in a manner that we can't see because we're relying on inferential mapping to look so by definition we can't see it because the very equipment we're using is blind to the entanglement and so we have to learn to drop the way we normally look mm -hmm. and this is a non-doing we have to lay down um, in buddhism it's called taking refuge mm. in Christianity is called surrendering to Christ. You know, it, it's a laying down of something. But if we don't know what to lay down, forget it. I mean, come on. You know, so it's, it's not so easy. You just lay, you know, lay down what exactly? Well, it become precise about conceptuality. Mm -hmm. There comes a point where you can deliberately lay it down. So it's ultimately a decision. It's ultimately. Mm. And this is something again that will emerge. It will find as you go on through this thing. Ultimately, it's a decision. But you can only make a clear decision like this if you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a nonsense. It's going mad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> I wonder if anyone else has anything they like to discuss i know that uh richard's been very generous with his time here but, uh, yeah time's ticking away i've got to go in 10 minutes um okay. but yeah so any, please ask yeah. away and it's a, i'm so happy you guys are reading this book and yeah. great john to find someone who's not gray haired that must be <laughs> yeah <laughs> or no or no haired or no head exactly you're the yeah. youngest i've ever seen reading revelations of mine that's very impressive can't get my kids to read it i'll tell you <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> you, you the, the, main thing, the main thing I feel again and again is 
we unconsciously situate the destination we seek in the map we're trying to escape from. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's the enigma of the spiritual path. Could you say that again? <laughs> unconsciously situate the destination we seek in the map that we look, I forget what I said, the map we look for it with, not quite so elegant. First time you look at this into the recording, these things come out. Um, and, it, and it's because I'm not working from a map when I speak this shit. I'm just. Yeah. But <clears throat> allowing innate intelligence to speak in its own yeah. water is the key. If we try and improve innate intelligence by making it work well, we actually cover it over. Innate intelligence speaks with its own voice. It doesn't need any assistance. It's what's known as the gold and silver chains of speech in Search for Reaches Land's Limits. It, it's mm -hmm. Search for Reaches Land's Limits is card 14 of the tarot pack. And mm -hmm. I used to be an esoteric teacher years back. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I know this. And, and what happens is the searcher comes to a cliff edge and there's this huge chasm. And then there's water. And in the distance is the promised land mm -hmm. that he's trying to get to. And the guy suddenly realized, I'm never going to get there. This is like the there's thousands of feet high. And there's this sea. And then, and then there are these chains of speech called the gold and silver chains of speech that cross over the water to the promised land. Mm. And this is all to do with this, that actually we can, but we can only do so by not doing something we're currently doing. It's a non-doing. It's not a doing. And the genius of Tartang Rimshe is recognizing that he had in Westerners an audience whose conceptuality was so well developed that he could literally turn it on itself. <coughs> That's what he is doing. Mm -hmm. And so the, the metaphor of the regime of mind, which is completely unique to him, it really is. That's something that you don't find. Much of what's in Revelations can be located in Tibetan Buddhism, but Regime of mind is definitely a TT invention. Yeah. And he is, what he's done is he's provided the perfect metaphor for Western conceptual thinkers to get their teeth into. Mm -hmm. And this can undo itself mm -hmm. if it's done fully. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the process. Mm -hmm. Mm Nuke, do you have any uh, questions or comments? I'm having trouble with my system. <laughs> well, we can hear you and see you. So go ahead and ask a question if you like. No, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Just wanted to give you an opportunity. Yeah, all right, thank you. Alan, do you have any feedback? Uh, <clears throat> Not exactly, no. Uh, Alan's know. a total cat. He doesn't need to give feedback. <laughs> <laughs> you never build a boat with him. There's a different yeah. side to him. Yeah. Uh, but wow. the idea that it, it, it's the non-doing that makes mm -hmm. it happen, that you move into a different world. It's well, it's not so much the non-doing. It's the realizing, the realization that if you understand doing totally, there's always non-doing at its heart. Mm -hmm. so it's the difference this is about difference and then having got a taste for it beginning to see how conceptuality is triggered and you're going to get into this i think you're going to see that the conceptual map triggers us and it does so because it's protective so when we walk about our daily business, we're being um, impacted, bombarded by injunctions mm -hmm. from our conceptuality, which trigger us into me and it. It's very hard to stay non-conceptual in the face of all this information. And that's the challenge to our shamatha because we lose our center, we lose our mindfulness, because conceptuality 
triggers us into learned behavior as a shorthand because it's protective. It worked before, it'll work again. Just do that. And by the time that's occurred, too late. Then we can remember and go, oh, I did that. That was stupid. Well, that's good. At least you remembered. But ultimately, we want to be at the point where that triggering is itself an object of concentration. And we can say, no, I'm not going to be triggered. I'm not going to go there. And once that happens, boy, the whole world is different. Because then you suddenly realize, my God, everyone's walking around in a dream. They're all in this dream of self where they think they know what they're doing. But actually, they're working from a playbook that Google and Apple and all these people know just as well as they do. Yeah, they're robots. And only in brief moments do people awaken into genuine existence. Most of the time, it's merely learned. And this is a, a, a very big recognition. Then you walk around looking at people and go, by God, they're all just filling out their roles. Mm -hmm. You know what they're doing. And that's a real shock. And then you look at your own life and go, my God, 98% of the time, probably, it's learnt behavior. Just doing the next thing. Mm -hmm. There's very little living happening. <laughs> and that's the mm -hmm. moment when this really starts to become urgent. Mm -hmm. Because if the program is flawed, mm -hmm. as it inevitably is, we are always heading towards disaster like lemmings. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the better and better weapons we have, the more dangerous it gets, that's essentially it. You know, that's why there's this sense of urgency in Revelations that keeps coming through. Mm -hmm. Because in many ways, you know, we're drumbeat marching towards disaster the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then going, oh, well, that's just the way it is. You know, what to do? Well, the answer is we have to awaken within our own experience. And then that will ripple because just like a moment of capital U understanding within your own experience impacts your own world. The, if you're in capital U understanding and you, you meet other people, it impacts them as well. Because suddenly you're the stranger in the village and they're going, well, what is this? What's happening here? This guy's not, not working properly. And, it, and that's how you awaken other people, just by being with them. You don't have to do anything. Just your very presence is enough. And that's why this is something very important. So that it's not that, that we have to change the world. It's not a political program. Changing the world, unfortunately, is within the world. So you don't. That's why, unfortunately, politics is self-limiting. All that happens is go round and round in circles, replicating the problems that you start with. That is completely pointless. But when people who live in a different way interact with others, they change the world by default. It's all it takes. So, you know, I'm not a fan of Buddhist environmentalism and all this sort of stuff because it's bullshit. What we need just be is Buddhas. And then we'll change the world and we'll fix the environment. That'll all go right. That just comes along. You don't have to worry about it. That's the thing. And so... Having this recognition that non-duality is an end in itself is the key. That's it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I'm looking at the clock. And, yeah, uh, it's time, I guess. Yeah, I think perhaps. Uh, yeah. Anyway, guys, any time you want me to come back and dominate your conversation. Any time. Yeah. Well, no, I, I'm more than happy. I'm delighted you're working your way through it. I'm glad you're going slowly. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, uh, you're, you, what today was invaluable. And I'm so glad right. that I recorded it because uh, I will certainly re I will review this again, and I, I have many notes that I'll, I'll have to pause and listen again. So I'm gonna good. And and you know, please just keep going slowly and invite me back any time. I mean, I you're, you're you're in the second half now, so you're beginning yeah. to engage with this bigger picture, okay? Which um, you know, it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go on. Through okay. The okay. Good stuff. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you Richard. Much appreciated. Pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, by the way, do join Dharma College's chat lines. You know, we have chat lines now. No. We have a community portal for people who aren't even members of the college. <laughs> uh, oh. And there are all kinds of working groups there and all kinds of things. You might have a look at it. It's just on our website. You just go to community, click on that, sign up, okay. and you can access all kinds of material. That, What's the website been. again? It's called www 
dharma-college.org. Okay. We might be .com. I can't one okay. or the other. Or just type in Dharma College into Google. Funny if we come okay. up with this. <laughs> I will. I will. Okay. okay. Thank you, Richard. See ya. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so all. much. Goodbye. It's good. It's good seeing you all the way. Thanks, John. Glad you were here. Yeah. yeah, likewise. And thank you for recording. Uh, please do share yeah, that recording well, too when you get the I, chance. Th oh, I will. And thank you for thank you for your good questions. You know, you really you really contributed a lot today. So thank you for that. Thank you. You too, sir. Honestly, right. they're, they're they're they definitely brought they brought some amazing insights. So thank you too. Okay. All right. Adios, so you to say and, you it's all very really great. And uh, uh, well, well, let's try to get together. Well, there's next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's next there week. Be. Yeah. There is. There is every week. Every week. Yeah, I, I'm, gonna share, I, I'm gonna share my part of my birthday present with you. Oh, when good. you get a chance, go and just Google the song by Paul Simon, Simon mm -hmm. and Garfunkel, Paul Simon. Have a good time. The first right. line starts out and is personal to me at this moment. Yesterday it was my birthday. I hung one Where more year on the line. <laughs> Listen to the song and risk and know that I'm sending the message to you. Have a good time. All Bye. right. Okay, I will. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And happy late birthday, by the way. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy yeah, birthday. Yeah, no, it was ma magical. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye. Awesome. Take See care. You later. See you.